Did you know the FBI does not list 9-11 as one of bin Laden's crimes? Why not? According to Rex Toom, chief of investigative publicity for the FBI, it is because there is no hard evidence linking bin Laden to the attacks. If that is the case, how could the 9-11 Commission conclude it was the work of 19 radical Muslims from the Middle East under the direction of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Osama bin Laden? Bin Laden has been universally blamed for 9-11, but if one takes a closer look at the available evidence, it points to a much darker power. Seven years later, what evidence has been gathered? Let's begin with the hijackers. Many of them were actually trained within U.S. military bases. On September 15, 2001, Newsweek reported that U.S. military sources have given information that suggests five of the alleged hijackers received training at secure U.S. military installations in the 90s. Saeed Al-Ghamdi, Ahmed Al-Nami, and Ahmed Al-Ghamdi listed their address on driver's licenses and car registrations as the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. Another indication of how the hijackers were tied to U.S. bases was reported on September 12th by Fox in D.C. They stated, congratulatory phone calls were made from a separate aeronautical school in Florida, which suggests inside help for the hijackers. Now here at Embry-Riddle School in Daytona Beach, investigators say that they did indeed intercept cell phone calls that originated out of here, calls that were congratulatory after yesterday's attacks. Calls the feds say were made by terrorist sympathizers here in Daytona as well as in Broward County. The New York Times would report that the Defense Department said that Ada had gone to the International Officer School at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. Abdul Aziz Alamari to the Aerospace Medical School at Brooks Air Force Base in Texas and Saeed al Gamdi to the Defense Language Institute at the Presidio in Monterey, California. The Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at the Defense Language Institute where al Gamdi trained went public and said, Bush knew of the impending attacks on America. He did nothing to warn the American people because he needed this war on terrorism. He was quickly disciplined and threatened with court-martial. Even when neighbors called the CIA on hijacker Walid al Shiri, nothing was done. Now, you might think that some of the neighbors would be shocked to find out that a suspected terrorist lived right down the street from them, but at least one woman we spoke with was not surprised at all. Diane Albritton was so concerned about what was happening inside the home at 502 Orange Street, she called the CIA. Why was she suspicious? The odd coming and going, um, the different rental cars, the odd-looking people that came and went. At that time, she says, the agency was not interested. How could it be that the CIA wasn't interested in this woman's story? Meanwhile, in San Diego, two hijackers were living openly, despite their identities already being known to the CIA and FBI as known Al-Qaeda operatives. In September 2000, the two moved into the home of a tested undercover asset who had been working closely with the FBI office in San Diego on terrorism cases. This FBI asset was identified in wire reports as a retired professor of English at San Diego State, as well as Vice President for International Projects at American Commonwealth University. In fact, this known FBI asset never taught at San Diego State, nor had he been a professor of English and possesses a phony PhD from a bogus diploma mill run by people with U.S. military and intelligence connections. And the university for which he has said to be a vice president for international projects does not, in fact, exist. It is merely a mail drop. American Commonwealth University was previously named William Lyon University named and founded for retired Air Force General William Lyon, a big wheel in California Republican circles as chairman of the GOP's Team California Victory 2004 and a member of a group of wealthy, high-powered Orange County's Republicans called the New Majority. So, to summarize, an FBI informant housed at least two of the 9-11 terrorists and worked for a non-existent university with Republican and military intelligence connections. That's not suspicious, right?
So how did these known terrorists get into the United States in the first place? Fifteen of the September 11th hijackers were Saudis here on visas they obtained from the U.S. Embassy in Saudi Arabia. Three of them without even being interviewed by a consular official. The Visa Express program was started in June 2001 by U.S. Embassy officials in Saudi Arabia which allowed visas to be given out without an interviews or background checks being conducted. From Saudi Arabia, a country with a large population known to be sympathetic to Osama bin Laden. The Visa Express program, which was initiated three months before 9-11, was only introduced in Saudi Arabia, and no such privileges were extended to any of our other allies or European friends. Deputy Secretary of State and PNAC member Richard Armitage rejected recommendations from the Justice Department's Foreign Terrorist Tracking Task Force to deny some visas. And I quote, Unfortunately, the information we have received from Foreign Terrorist Tracking Task Force so far has been insufficient to permit a consular officer to deny a visa, he wrote. The information we have received states only that the FTTTF believes the applicants may pose a threat to national security. Yeah, that's, that's right. Only a threat to national security. That's all. Other government officials would go public as well. J. Michael Springman, a former head of the Visa Department in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, would blow the whistle that the United States was taking part in covert programs as far back as 1987 to funnel in and protect Islamic terrorists. Well, it began in Jeddah when I was repeatedly told to issue visas to unqualified applicants. This went on for quite some time during most of my tour there. Under the American immigration laws, you need to demonstrate that you're going to the United States for a specific purpose. And typically, uh, in such a situation, you're going to sign a business deal, or you're going to go as a tourist to see the Grand Canyon, or you're going to the United States as a, as a student to study a particular course of study. And these were people that uh, had no job in one instance. He was a Sudanese uh, who was unemployed in Saudi Arabia and a refugee from the Sudan. But he got a visa for national security purposes after uh, it was taken out of my hands by the chief of the consular section. At basis, though, I really think that these were more CIA assets, people that were recruited, like uh, all of the folks I've been issuing visas to uh, a couple of years previously. And uh, these people uh, were tools to be done for a job. Well, the visas issued to the hijackers in Jeddah uh, came about as a result of it being a CIA consulate. It was the fifth largest visa issuing post in the Middle East. Uh, it was pretty much a, a closed system, and they simply brought them through there, and knowing that they would be protected by the agency, that people would uh, get their visas, or if they didn't get the visas, they could be made to be given visas. Once I got back to the United States and was out of the Foreign Service, I ran across a couple of people with ties to the American government uh, that told me another story, that the CIA was recruiting fighters for the Afghan war against the then Soviets and that their asset, Osama bin Laden, was working with them. In the early 1980s, bin Laden worked with operatives from U.S. intelligence, the Pakistani military, and Arab states. They ran a wide-ranging covert network that recruited and financed Muslim fighters to battle the Soviet army. It is now known that Osama bin Laden was a CIA asset under the codename Tim Osman. Bin Laden would use this handle when he would visit the states. The relationship between bin Laden and the CIA uh, was essentially... Uh, he was one of the assets, one of the people they could turn to for help if they had questions. If they wanted somebody recruited, if they wanted somebody sent somewhere, if they wanted information, if they wanted something done, they went to Bin Laden. Bin Laden isn't wanted by the FBI, and he was on a CIA payroll? Is he the brutal Islamic terrorist we have been led to believe, or a mere frontman 